If you'd open your Bibles to John chapter 12. The title of my message today is Honoring Christ. And we're going to read just the first three verses, and then I will be reading more verses as we go along. John chapter 12. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Mary honored Jesus Christ. Several years ago, Mary and I, along with a good friend of ours, Steve Doster and his wife, went to a dinner to honor our coach, our baseball coach in college, Russ Tiedemann. Russ coached the Oshkosh Titan baseball team for 20 years. And so the players and their wives during those 20 years of time were invited to attend a special dinner. A few players were selected to give him honor and then they gave him a gift that was from all of the players that he had over those 20 years of time. Years later, on April 26, 2014, players again were invited for a special Russ Tiedemann Day during a doubleheader in, in a baseball game at Tiedemann Field. In his 20 years of coaching baseball at Oshkosh, his teams won the conference championship 15 times. They had one national championship. They were runner-up to the national championship twice, and he was named National Coach of the Year in 1974 and in 1985. In 2012, he was named the head coach of the Wisconsin Intercollegiate Association of Coaches for All Sports. Those are some outstanding credentials but in comparison to Jesus Christ, they are just a drop in the Pacific Ocean. Jesus, in three years, healed thousands. I only used the book of Matthew, but listen to this. I'll read some of the things in the book of Matthew. Matthew 4, 23 to 25 says, and Jesus was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him went out into all Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, taken with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee and Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. In chapter 8, uh, verse 16, it says this, And when evening had come, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were ill. Chapter 9 Verse 35, and Jesus was going about all the cities and the villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness. In chapter 12, uh, in verse 15, but Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there and many followed him and he healed them all. Before feeding the 5,000, it says, and he healed them all. And there were 20, approximately 20,000 people there, and he healed them all. At the feeding of the 4,000, he healed them all. When he was in the temple the second time at the very last week of his life here on earth, it says in, in the temple, he healed them all that came to him. 
On top of all those who were healed, Jesus walked on water, calmed the sea, raised the dead, and there's many other miracles in the Bible. And on top of all these things, Jesus was the greatest teacher that ever walked this land. People came from all over in order to hear this man preach the gospel. And after the Sermon on the Mount, it says in Matthew 7, verses 28 and 29, the result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the multitudes were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. You know what? Jesus is the greatest in all things. As it says in Hebrews chapter 1, that he is the exact representation of his Father, God, and he holds all things together. David Letterman gave a list of the 10 greatest athletes of his time in each of the sports. Willie Mays, Simone Biles, Jim Brown, Tiger Woods, Usain Bolt, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, Serena Williams, Michael Phelps, Wayne Gretzky, and Michael Jordan. You could have all of these players together sit at one supper, and it would be an honor to sit with them. At least I would be honored to sit with just one of them but they would have to sit in another room from where Jesus was. And if they do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, they will not be at the most important supper in their lives, which is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Acts 4.12 says, there is therefore no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. For those who know Christ, Revelation 19, 7 says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give honor and glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Oh, so would you, would you pray with me as we give praise to him? We praise you, Father, for sending your son. We praise you for being a great God, a gracious Father. We praise you for being kind and loving and caring for being a holy God, a righteous and just and merciful. We praise you, Jesus. You are the exact representation of your Father. We praise you that you hold all things together. We ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would open our minds, open our heart, our ears, our eyes, that you would speak to us this morning. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In chapter 11, Jesus brought his good friend Lazarus back from the dead after Lazarus was in a tomb four days. Many believed in him. Others did not. And they went to the Pharisees and told them that Jesus, what Jesus had done in order for the Pharisees to be more upset with Jesus. In turn, the scribes and the Pharisees dishonored Jesus as they proclaimed him as a traitor to their religion, and they disgraced him. The Bible says that from that day on, they planned to kill him. The Pharisees feared that the miracles that Jesus did, the followers that Jesus had, and the many who believed that Jesus was the Messiah would start a movement against the Roman government. The truth is, they were envious of him, and they wanted Jesus executed by the Romans in order to spare their own positions. Therefore, Caiaphas spoke blasphemy against Jesus. God saw the evil that was in Caiaphas, 
And because God is sovereign, God directed the words of Caiaphas. And in chapter 11, verse 51, it says this. Oh, I got to go back to John. Sorry about that. Chapter 11, verse 51 of John says this, Now this he did not say on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation. Now, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving, but Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. On Saturday, six days before the Passover, Jesus came up out of the country. The, the law of Moses required that the Hebrew people were to observe the Passover feast. People were already coming to Jerusalem from all over the Roman Empire. They even came as far from, as Rome in order to get to Jerusalem. Jesus was not far from Jerusalem at the time of the feast. It would soon be time for Jesus to accomplish what God sent him here to do. To die for our sins and to deliver us sinners from eternal hell. A far greater deliverance than all military deliverances throughout all of history put together. So they made Jesus a dinner there. Mary was there. Martha was serving. Lazarus was reclining at the table with Jesus. We find out a little bit later that Jesus' disciples were there too. They had this dinner in honor of Jesus. When we have breakfast, lunch, and dinner, do we invite Jesus to sit down with us? Do we give him the honor that is due him? I remember a prayer that we used to say when I was a young boy. I had three brothers. And so before the meals, we would say a prayer. It went like this, and some of you probably are familiar with it. Come, Lord Jesus, and be our guest and let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. Except that as four boys would be, it was this. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Let these gifts to us be blessed. Amen. Pass the potatoes. It was insincere. We did not understand what we were talking about. We raced through it fast so that we could start eating. The words were not sincere. Our prayers, any of our prayers, whether they are done at mealtime or any other time, if they are not sincere, it is just dust in the wind. It is worthless. It is wasted time. Are we honoring Christ by inviting him to our meals? And are our prayers sincere or are they just vain repetition? Martha served months earlier, if you can remember. She complained to Jesus because Mary was not helping her to serve her. This time, she very likely served, and while she was serving, she was listening to what Jesus was talking about. This time, she had a greater love for Jesus. It is far better to serve Christ gently slowly, caring, then running around like a chicken with its head chopped off, trying to do what we can with a rotten attitude. Are we honoring Christ with a good attitude when we serve others, when we are helping others, when we are working, when we are doing some recreational thing, 
Are we honoring Christ when we do those things? God does see us, and other people see us also. Verse 3 goes on to say, Mary, therefore, took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. It was common to anoint the head of the rabbis who attended marriage feasts with fragrant oil. Special guests were sometimes honored also. Mary had a flask of very costly oil, pure nard perfume. That meant that there was nothing else added to it. And Mary honored Jesus by joyfully anointing the feet of Jesus with the costly perfume. In the books of Matthew and Mark, they also record that she poured it on his head for his anointing, but then she poured it on his feet, and then she washed his feet with her hair. This was the costliest anointing oil. It was drawn from an Indian plant. It was worth about a year's wages. What an honor to be anointed with this perfume and to give Jesus more honor, Mary wiped his feet with her hair. Such depth and sincerity of love comes only through spending time with close fellowship with Jesus. Think about it. Would you have used a year's wages to anoint Jesus' head and his feet and then wipe his feet with your hair? I believe some people would. Henry Blackaby said, the way we express our love for Jesus depends on the kind of relationship we have developed with him. Our love for him will not grow unless we spend time with him, listen to his voice, and experience his love for us. How is our fellowship and honor towards Christ? If our love for Jesus has cooled off, or we struggle to serve him, it's a sign that we need to sit at Jesus' feet like Mary did. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Not only did Mary give what may have been her life savings, but she was also willing to give up her reputation. In first century Middle East culture, women who were respected never let their hair down in public. To honor Jesus and to worship Jesus in this way was thought by most people as being immodest and by some people as being immoral. Mary loved Jesus so much that it did not matter what people thought of her. Mary humbled herself before Jesus. Are we willing to honor Jesus Christ and worship him regardless of what other people think of us? Daily Bread writer Julie Ackerman Link said, when our greatest fear is letting down our hair, Perhaps our greatest sin is keeping it up. Do we love Jesus more than the world and what people may think of us? We need to give our best to Jesus, our best effort, our best attitude, our best affection. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed... Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. 
True love for Christ does not spare in honoring him. Mary offered a gift worthy of a king. And considering what Jesus did for us, we need to be willing to give our very best in order to honor him. Are we doing that? Jen Wilkins said, when we begin to follow Christ, we resolve to love God even if it costs us. And it does cost us. It costs us our pride, our comfort, our self-will, our self-sufficiency. At times it costs us relationships with family, our expectation of safety, and more. But in laying these aside, we learn the worthiness of the object of our love in a deeper way. We find increasing freedom, and as we mature, we resolve to love God no matter what it costs. Luke 18, 8, 16 says, No one after lighting a lamp covers it over with a container or puts it under a bed, but he puts it on a lampstand in order that those who come in may see the light. We live in a broken world. In Romans 13, 12, it says, The night is almost gone and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Jesus said, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Are we giving him our best? Are we honoring Christ in the things that we are doing? Are we putting on the armor of light? Are we letting our light shine for Jesus, or is it under our bed? Verse 4. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples who was intending to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to poor people? Now he said this not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief, and as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. In contrast to Mary, Judas Iscariot is revealing his true nature. He was the treasure of the disciples, he did not care for the poor. That was a front that he was putting on for the other people who were there. He didn't care about the other 11 disciples. He did not care about Mary. He would have made a great Pharisee. He cared for himself. He cared for his own pocket. He was the person who kept track of the money for Jesus and the disciples. He took the money out of the treasury without letting others know what he was using it for. It's called embezzlement. He had a secret sin. He had many other sins, but he also had secret sin. Not only that, Satan was working through Judas to influence the other disciples of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 6, it says, But the disciples were indignant when they saw this, and they said, Why this waste? Judas was an imposter who influenced Jesus' disciples. Are we influenced by others to sin? No matter how much we love Jesus, no matter how caring or humble that we may be, we can be influenced by other people. There are other Judases in this world, and they will influence us. They're not just people who steal. They're people who are being influenced by Satan to have other gods before them, to use God's name in vain, to dishonor their parents, to do a lot of complaining, to lie, to covet, to covet what their neighbor has, and other sins. Satan is a liar, he's a, a deceiver, he's a murderer. We need to be careful. The Bible says, he who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. 
Are we being influenced by others to do what is sin? Or are we honoring Christ by doing what is right when we are faced with temptations and we all face temptations? Judas discouraged affection, devotion, and love toward Jesus. Judas did not want Jesus to be honored. Judas had a coldness toward Jesus. Judas was a false teacher. He was a fake. He was a hypocrite. He was a thief. He was a liar. A lying character opens the door to the influence of Satan. Some of us have seen them. Their thinking is very secular. They might honor him externally, but internally in their heart, they might be lost or they might be a believer, but they're not walking with Christ. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Judas' words did not come from a heart of charity. Judas did not have compassion towards the poor. He had a craving for money. And this became a snare and a trap to him. 1 Timothy 6, 9 says, But those who want to get rich fall into a temptation and a snare and many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Five days later, Judas betrayed Jesus into the hands of the Roman soldiers and the Sanhedrin for 30 pieces of silver, which at that time was the price of a slave. We can be influenced by others to do what is wrong or to do sinful things. We can also run into opposition from others. The opposition that think we are foolish may come from unbelievers or it can come from believers. Some people will say, Look what you could have had if you sold the perfume. Look what you could have had if you took the job that paid you twice as much. Look what you could have had if you wouldn't have volunteered for that or if you wouldn't have taken the time to prepare a Bible study or whatever it is that the Lord is asking you to do. Look what you could have had if you wouldn't have been so honest. Are we standing on the word of God? Are we honoring Christ and standing strong for the sake of Jesus? Psalms 119.9 says, How can a young man keep his way pure? The rest of the verse goes on to tell you the answer. By keeping it according to thy word. Keeping it according to God's word. Because Jesus knows what we are doing at all times should cause us to keep our way pure. But then we can still choose to sin. God might not immediately do anything in order to stop us or to give us a consequence, He will send us warning signs. He has given us a conscience to know if it is a sin. And what we deserve is going to come sooner or later. Jen Wilkins said this, The longer we live the life of faith, the greater our sin of awareness of sin will grow. We will never reach the end of our confession this side of heaven nor will we ever reach the end of his faithfulness to meet our confession with forgiveness. Verse 7, Jesus therefore said, Let her alone in order that she may keep it for the day of my burial, for the poor you always have with me, for the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Whenever we have people who are opposed to what God is leading us to do, we can count on Jesus and the Holy Spirit to come to our aid. Jesus came to the aid of Mary. 
He understands what we are experiencing. Hebrews 2.18 says, For he him, since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Jesus accepted Mary's kindness and love. Jesus was pleased and protected her. God is pleased with us when we do things for, us, for him. He will defend us. He is our Jehovah Megan, means he is our shield. David said in Psalms 28, verse 7, The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart exalts, and with my song I shall thank him. Jesus' response to Judas and the disciples does not teach us to neglect the poor so that we can spend money extravagantly on Christ. No, this was for a special purpose and anointed for the anticipated burial of Jesus who was the king of all kings. And it was a declaration of faith that Jesus is the Messiah. The one who was prophesied to come. The one that the Jews were waiting for. While the poor would always be here, Jesus would not always be with them. Matthew Henry said, The good duty which may be done at any time should wait for now and give way to that which can only be done now. Do we honor Christ by having our priorities right? What is the most important thing right now in our life? That is what he wants us to do. What's most important now? Verse 9, the great multitude, therefore, of the Jews learned that he was there, and they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him many of the Jews were going away and were believing in Jesus. When the great multitude of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came to see Jesus. But they also came to see Lazarus, whom Jesus raised from the dead. Jesus was a very popular man. They wanted to see Jesus. They also wanted to see Lazarus. What a great miracle to be raised from the dead after being in a tomb four days. I wouldn't be able to do this now, but I would have walked hundreds of miles in order to see Jesus. And Lazarus would just be a bonus. Would we walk a hundred miles? There will be some who will seek Jesus no matter what happens in their life. There are others who have no interest in Jesus in spite of all that he has done for them. When the people knew where Jesus was, they came to him. Do we honor Christ by coming to him throughout our day, during our travel, while we work, when we go to bed at night, Wherever Christ was, there was a gathering of people. Some came to hear the story from Lazarus. Some came to gratify their curiosity. They came for many reasons. But regardless of what the reasons were that they came, many of them came in order to honor Jesus, and they did that by coming to see him. On the other hand, 
the chief priests and the so-called religious leaders, the ones who were supposed to shepherd the flock of Israel, they were so far away from God that they could not even see the Messiah when he was standing right there with them. They were so evil, so wicked, that they plotted to kill the very one that they're waiting for. Not only that, they plotted to kill the one Jesus had raised from the dead. The Pharisees and other religious leaders did all they could to dishonor Jesus. They allowed Satan to rule in their minds. Yet many of the Jews saw the evidence of Jesus' word and his miracles. They went away believing in Jesus. The resurrection of Lazarus put life in their faith and convinced them that Jesus was the Messiah. Do we honor Christ by believing that Jesus is the Messiah and that he is going to be coming again. Verse 12. On the next day, the great multitude had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They took branches of the palm trees and they went out to meet him and began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. When the great multitude that came to the Passover feast heard Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they got ready to honor Jesus. They took branches of the palm trees and they went out to meet him and they began to cry out, Hosanna, which means save now blessed is he who comes in the name of the lord even the king of israel they honored jesus also psalms 104 verse 1 says bless the lord o my soul o lord my god thou art very great thou art clothed with honor and majesty David said in Psalms 21, 5, His glory is great through thy salvation, honor, and majesty. Thou dost place upon him. Are we sincerely honoring Christ? I have seven questions to ask, and I need to be honest. I fail. I sin, but I want to challenge you. And by the way, I'm, I'm working on them. We need to be working. We all sin. We need to be working on the things that we fail in, the things that we are weak in. First, do we honor Jesus by preparing to meet Jesus daily and then taking Jesus with us throughout our day? Do we honor Jesus by having a good attitude when we serve him? Do we honor Jesus Christ and worship him regardless of what others may think of us? Do we honor Jesus Christ with our armor of light or do we put it under our bed? Five, do we honor Jesus Christ by standing on the word of God when tempted, or do we give in to our desires or the influence of the world? Do we honor Christ by standing up for what is right? And last, do we honor Christ by doing what is important for him now? If we are failing, we need to repent and we need to change our ways and work on them. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Will you pray with me?
Father, we ask you to help us to honor your son. We confess that there are times that we fail. And we ask for your Holy Spirit to help us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.